Consequently, I'm going to grant the request of the location. Prepare an order, Mr. Kim. Your Honor, Joel, on behalf of Real Water, I want to put, the, put this in some context for the court. Um, March of this year, and why, that, why that's important is because um, the special master had ruled that if you do testing on real water, the product itself, you must disclose that testing. They're trying to draw a distinction that they did the secret testing on the probe and therefore it does not have to be disclosed. First of all, that's improper for all the reasons the plaintiffs have argued about their discovery responses and so forth. But here's where it's damaging to real water, Your Honor. We received the test results from Eurofin's laboratory done by UNFW in between our initial disclosures for experts and our rebuttal disclosures. And as the court's well aware, Dr. Gordon <coughs> then opined that the, the outbreak was due to hydrazine after receiving that testing. As part of that, Your Honor, and, and, and here's where it's so damaging, we don't know what this testing would show. We, this testing could have shown that the meter was not functioning, or the probe was, was not functioning correctly, or there's a problem with the probe, or it could have showed it was working perfectly, or it could have showed something else. <clears throat> what we do know is real water conceded liability towards the end of this case. Had this testing been so bad for the defense, Real Water may have conceded liability back in March. That would have saved Real Water a lot of money, it would have saved the plaintiffs a lot of money, it would have saved a lot of motions before this court. We just do not know the impact <coughs> that this would have had on the case. We can only guess it could have been positive for the defense, it could have been negative for the defense. But either way, it would have had an impact on the defense. Let's say it was positive for the defense. Maybe Real Water decides, oh, maybe we're not going to concede liability, or maybe we have a cross claim against these parties. But that's where the prejudice comes in for Real Water. And to say that um, it should be confined to just one of the defendants just doesn't work. First of all, Mr. Savaggio testified for both defendants. And second of all, one of the defenses put forth by the meter defendants, and one of the attacks put forth by the meter defendants is that, oh, well, we did testing, but Real Water didn't do testing, Real Water didn't do safety testing. So not only are they misrepresenting what Real Water did, because we know Real Water did testing, it's not for hydrazine, but they're capitalizing and attempting to draw a distinction between themselves and Real Water. In fact, when we did opening statements, Mr. Rasmussen punished those responsible if you feel you need to after you've heard all of the evidence for causing the poison. That's how we finished. And then Mr. Robbins for him for uh, Milwaukee gets up and he starts with a recitation of, of some facts and they write not even a page later. Okay, those are the facts. There is no safety testing. And then he concludes, the problem is we've made hydrazine, okay? As Mr. Kemp told me yesterday, you shouldn't have a drop of hydrazine in your bottle of water. I don't care what measures what, you don't add, then add hydrazine poison to your water. So clearly, both co-defendants, both meter defendants, are working together on this defense. The testimony is, is tied together. Both meter defendants attempted to put forth that, oh, well, we did testing and it came out great. Real water didn't do any testing. And that's why you and the jury should find against them. That is not a proper defense. That is an improper defense. Proper defense to strict products liability is, very, is uh, uh, misuse of the product, or I forget the second one, it doesn't apply here. Assumption uh, of risk. Uh, assumption of risk. Here, we've got all of this nonsense about real water's purported negligence that has nothing to do with use of the product. In fact, on Friday, we get the transcripts if they want to play for this jury today about the Eurofins testing. So not only are they not learning the lesson, they are intending to continue to violate this court's order, violate the law, and put forth an improper defense. And for those reasons, the remedy should apply to both. And, and Your Honor, this is just completely improper. It started at opening. We objected during opening. We objected during the witnesses. Now it's continued through Mr. Savaggio, and now they want to continue it 
and play two impro completely improper clips from Wayne Jones and from, uh, what is this, like Brown? Anthony Brown. Anthony Brown. <clears throat> so that's the last thing the jury hears. So not content with just the prejudice that caused an opening during the course of the trial, they want to make sure that this prejudice is the last thing the jury hears. For those reasons, we also believe that the, the clips that they proposed to play today that provided to us at 11, practically 11 o'clock on Friday, those should not be allowed. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rasmussen. Laura Brown did not testify in this case. Any sort of testing that she uh, could have may be conducted that has not been completed, has not been done, and is not evidence in front of this particular jury, so there has been nothing done here with regard to that. In addition, any testing that, that is ongoing has not used real water, which is the subject matter of the special master work. Meaning, if you're going to test anything having to do with a real water product, you have to do that in the open. Uh, what we don't even know, and I have not disclosed, and no one has said that it was, has anything to do with the probe. That's in question here. What, what, what's going on at all? So it's rampant speculation, as Mr. Obu just used the following two words, guess and assumption. Uh, so we are left with, there's supposedly testing that's out there that is still ongoing. We don't know what it's about. We don't know anything about whether it has to do with the probes. We don't even know if it's a Milwaukee probe. We don't know what probes. We don't know if it's even about probes. It could be about the meter. It could be about calibration. It could be about any number of things. But we're, they're all making but shouldn't, sense. We should not. If there's been testing going on, we should not. So what it's about, and here's my question, and it goes, I'm looking at page four of the plaintiff's position mm -hmm. on sanctions for concealing three secret tests on the probe oxidation. Now, I mean, I, it seems to me I don't need to go any further than page four. Okay. At line nine, there's a question. Okay, let's, and w was this by Mr. Kemp or who asked this question? I think that was me, Your Honor. Okay, this is by Mr. Park. I just want to make sure the record's clear. Mr. Line, Your Honor. Line 9, page 4. Thank you. That's a, and here's a question. Yes, yeah, that's on the 26. That's me, Your Honor. Okay, this is what Mr. Parker asked. Okay, let's make sure we are clear. Did you do any testing on the MW500 probe? So, the reason why that's important is talking about the probe, right? So, we know it's the probe. Mm -hmm. Then we go to the, the answer. Yes, I've done testing on the MW500. MW500 probe, uh, so he admitted it. And we go further, to my understanding, Mr. Moore did some testing. Now, there was testing done and it was on a probe. We, we know that just based upon the response, so we do have evidence that's in the record okay. on that specific issue. And, and here's the thing, as far as testing is concerned, uh, how, how long has Mr. Moore been, how long ago did he pass away? 2018, I believe, Your Honor. Okay. So, Mr. Moore did testing on the probe, what is that, five years ago? Two years, roughly before their initial 16 <clears throat> Right, and so we're at, and it's 2023, that's why I said five years. So we know Mr. Moore did some, and he, and he, you know, it's my understanding, he had a key role at the company, right? And so we said, here's his response. This is unfiltered, this is not any argument. He did some testing, but more importantly, he says, to my understanding, Mr. Moore did some testing. And the reason why this is kind of important, this goes to the, to the essence of the um, product's liability claim for relief. Uh, because if he tested the probe, I would think we'd want to know, okay, what are the results of that specific test as it relates to the probe? Was it regarding uh, conditioning and so on? You know, it was it a test involving, um, for example, uh, using vinegar. Or, or, or whatever, and, 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 and we don't have those results. And just as important, when was the tip card? 2018, the tip card came in 2018, uh, I guess after Brian Moore and Jason Brown came in after that. Okay, and my question is, when was the conditioning kit? 2017, Your Honor, it was <laughs> June 2017, they found that they couldn't use it, and we got real water, not we, but real water got noticed in December 2017. Well, 
And, and that's why I'm kind of drilling down on the timeline, because right. if he did testing in 2017, why was he doing testing as a result of the uh, conditioning kit being pulled from the market? That's right, right, John. Right? That's right? That's and right. so, I mean, I understand this case, and it seems to me, though, that, that testing done by Mr. Moore, more importantly than anybody, because it makes perfect sense. It lines right up. The EU's pulling the conditioning kit, and he's doing testing to determine what's an alternative for the use of the probe. Right. How can they condition without using or selling the conditioning kits? Your right. Honor, one thing that Mr. Kemp said over the weekend, I think it was over the weekend, we were going back and forth on this. What happens if that test results, and I think this is what Mr. Odell said, but what happens if that testing result said that it actually takes 10 days of oxidation? That means everything that's been said up to now would have been a lie and the tip card would have been completely unsupported. That would have, unfortunately, for uh, my ha uh, Hannah and Milwaukee, that would be the you know, end of the case for them. But it also would support what Mr. Odell said, that if he knew that back in March, he could have made different decisions. We would have all been able to make different decisions. Perhaps this was an emotion for summary judgment, Sean. But we've been robbed of that opportunity because none of that testing has been provided. Right. Um, I'm certainly back, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Let me just say, uh, Mr. Moore is the general manager of Milwaukee. He is not an employee of or affiliated in any way with Hannah. Just to address what Mr. Rasmussen said, Mr. Savaggio said that he has the right to hire and fire at Milwaukee. In his position, he determined, in fact, he determined Jason Brown getting that job to replace Mr. Moore. And I and asked during his deposition, does he have the authority to pick the next person? He said he has within his authority to pick the number one person and the number two person at Milwaukee. So to try to distance himself from Milwaukee with that statement, Your Honor, is inappropriate. And all I said was that. No, that's okay. Go ahead. I just make I know, I got cut off again. It's, yeah. it's typical. All I said was that Brian Moore was an employee of Milwaukee. That's all I said. I don't think that's in dispute, but I guess it's disputed about Carl Salvaggio. Again, Brian Moore is an employee of Milwaukee. Okay? It's not affiliated with him. What Mr. Moore did back in 2017, before he died, it's whatever, Mil whatever Milwaukee's general manager did then. But the obligation of that would have been an obligation of Milwaukee. And I believe they looked for it, asked for it, of Milwaukee for that testing. Because it would have been conducted by Milwaukee. And that has nothing to do with Hannah. And if they couldn't find it, they can't produce what they couldn't find. But I agree, I see this here, but that has nothing to do with Hannah. Hannah didn't do that testing. Here's what Brian right Moore is talking about. Here's my question on that issue, uh, as far as Mr. Savaggio, and he wore two hats. You can agree to agree on that issue. I mean, it appears to me that from a discovery purpose, uh, potentially three, one of three factors uh, could be met. That if there was testing, it would be potentially in his possession, custody, and or control. Okay. That's what the law requires, right? So, so he, he was wearing both ha two hats with Hannah and Milwaukee. Okay. So he potentially would have privy to the testing. Because one thing we know for sure, he knew that there was testing. It's pretty clear on that. He said, to my understanding, Mr. Moore did some testing. I, I don't disagree with your honor. Again, ask Mr. Moore, where's the testing? Where's it at? And I can't ask him. He's passed away. I don't think that fact is in dispute, but maybe I need to be cut off on that. Your Honor, it does factor in dispute. That's one of the factors under Young uh, Riviero. But the, if the information has been forever lost, that again bodes in favor of the sanction. So that doesn't help uh, Hannah or Milwaukee's position. And it certainly, of course, to me, with the, the Young Riviero factors. Oh, yeah. So I didn't think it was a dispute that he's passed away, but I guess it is now. No, no, it's not. Okay. No, no, I don't think it is. So 
you asked whether or not Mr. Savazi would have had control as a handler employee over that. Again, I can't speak for uh, Mr. Robbins, what he asked Mr. Savazi for with regard to anything that Brian Moore did. He'll probably tell you whatever he can tell you with regard to that. Okay? But since this would have been <coughs> testing conducted by Brian Moore, general manager of Milwaukee, that is where it starts first, and both of us are here. And that's as far as it goes. So I'm assuming, and now it's my assumption, that Mr. Robbins would have asked for that and gotten a response as to whether or not they could find that or not. But to then say that it's somehow now under the custody and control of Mr. Savaggio when if he did his diligence and tried to find it and couldn't find it, there was no trace of it, then that's where it's at. But I can tell you, when I took on this representation, I never talked to Brian Moore, okay? And I haven't talked to any of the employees of Milwaukee outside of Carl Silvaggio. And I'm not going to get into whatever discussions he had with Mr. Robbins, because Mr. Robbins is the attorney for Milwaukee. Circling back, again, Laura Brown was never put on the stand. There is no prejudice to this jury with regard to whatever she's done, if she's done anything that has anything to do with real water's water products, which I've already said it was not involved in that, or if it even has to do with probes that are used for Milwaukee. So that's what I can say. And until this is this appears to be much more of something that the special master needs to look at, <clears throat> unless there was something prejudicial in this case with regard to Laura Brown, which there can't be. The jury has no idea who she is where she's at. So to suggest that we should now pay compensatory damages as Hannah for something that never happened is a very, very strong sanction. With regard to Brian Warren on line nine, again, I think I told the court, I don't want to repeat myself. That's about Brian Moore, and he is, was definitely at the time the general manager of Milwaukee. That has nothing to do with my client today if, in fact, those documents were searched for by Milwaukee and were absent. It doesn't mean that when the plaintiff asks questions and he's answering them, he's not being truthful under oath to say that there was a testing done, okay, is either he, Mr. Salvaggio, lied and said that there was no testing, when there really wasn't testing. I need to say that again for the record. Either they're testing or not, but that's Mr. Salvaggio's question by Mr. Parker or Mr. Kemp on the stand. Now we want to be sanctioned for something that he said about testing. <coughs> and Hannah isn't, excuse me, Mr. Moore isn't an employee of Hannah. No matter where we go, he's definitely not. So, that's what I have to say. Thank you. You all, Mr. Mr. Robbins. Uh, I don't think they're asking for uh, instructions or sanctions against me. And maybe the court is wanting to put that on me. I don't know. But um, you got to understand this. I don't want to put anything on anybody. No, I, I'm saying everybody. I, I, I don't I mean, know that I need to address anything yeah, or but not. I, if you don't, that's okay. I just wanted, I don't want to overlook anybody. Okay. That's, and that's, I, that's, that's, that's the reason I just why. want to respond that I don't think it's clear from the record because Mr. Salvaggio goes back and forth in the transcript from 926. And uh, the plaintiffs have cited at page 178, on page 190, he goes back and forth. In one sentence, he says, well, he could have done testing. And then on another line, he says, it's more definite that he did some testing. And I, I generally recall at the end him kind of being crossed even harder, whether he had any personal knowledge of it. Um, and I'm reading through the transcript as I'm arguing to your honor. But um, uh, I, if, if there's any indication that there's going to be any kind of sanction, rebuttable, rebuttable, irrebuttable presumption, 
anything of those sorts, uh, damages, uh, whatever, whatever the request is, if it's against Milwaukee, then I am requesting that we have an evidentiary hearing on that issue because I do not think the record's that clear. I agree. There has been a, a record on this, especially Brian Moore. I, I certainly didn't talk to him. He's not my employee. Judge, I think, uh, as Mr. Parker alluded to, if you do an evidentiary hearing, we're going to delay this whole thing. And that's the one of the two primary reasons we uh, uh, decided that this is probably the appropriate thing, just a liability determination as opposed to striking the answer. So the evidentiary hearing is a big thing. Uh, the other thing is, remember, this is a bellwether case. Okay, Everyone understands that this is the bellwether case. and. The bellwether case is to potentially give us race judicata findings that are uh, useful in the subsequent litigation. And that's one of the reasons we have a 2018 plaintiff in here, two 2019 plaintiffs in here, an elderly plaintiff who died in here, a baby in here. We, we tried to get a representative group of plaintiffs so there wouldn't be as much argument as to whether or not uh, there was collateral stop in that. And the reason I bring that up, Your Honor, is that is really one of the primary reasons for me to seek this lower penalty, if you will, lower sanction, is what, what are we going to do in the future with it? Um, so if we have a determination against Milwaukee that there's liable to prevent the warrant, I can use that as res judicata in the future cases. If there's a default, uh, the answer stricken, they're going to stand up and tell Judge Kishner and everybody else, oh, there's, there hasn't been a determination. We didn't have a full and fair opportunity to litigate that issue. You can't take a default and use that to determine our liability in this different case. So, so that, that kind of ruins the whole reason for having this as a the case in the first case. And that means i got to go try the meter case again to make it binding on future cases. So that's the first thing I'm looking at. The second thing I'm looking at is there's going to be some pretty serious bad faith litigation after this case is over with. And in that bad faith litigation, typically uh, you take the result of the first case and you present that to the insurer and said, okay, the insured lost X amount. Okay, what did you do to responsibly handle this claim and was it responsible or not? That's it in the bad faith case. Okay. So now if we go up there with a default as opposed to an adjudication on the merits, and I'm particularly focused on this because Liberty is the insurance company for Milwaukee. So Liberty will stand up and say, oh, Mr. Kemp, this is a default. We have to try the case within the case. So they're going to want, in the insurance litigation, they're going to want me to prove the, I'm, I'm going to do the same case we just did here in the insurance litigation if we go up there with the answer to it. Um, uh, and then they're going to appeal it to the uh, Supreme Court. And like I told Mr. Parker over the weekend, now we have pretty monumental insurance litigation, in my view, and they're going to try to attack the foundation of it. You know, they're going to try to undercut it by taking the Supreme Court appeal. I'd rather just, you know, take my, and I'm taking a chance, you know, because I think, uh, you know, like I said before, Milwaukee's in up to their next two. Uh, but I would rather take the chance and just, make a liability determination on Hannah, uh, just as compensatory. Again, I'm, I'm not asking for a damage determination. I'm not asking for a punitive liability determination, and I'm not asking for a punitive amount determination. Mr. Rasmussen can contest that. He can make these arguments. I'm not asking for that. All I'm, all I'm saying is there's got to be some sanction here, because three different types of testing. You know, and he runs to Brian Moore and says, oh, Brian Moore's not my employee. Well, Laura Brown was his employee, and Laura Brown did secret testing starting in March, and they were going to put her on the witness stand Tuesday, last Tuesday, six days ago, to discuss this secret testing and blast us with it, undisclosed secret testing. And she was going to get up there and say, oh, the meter does this, the meter does that, I tested it, I know. Okay, so... So not only was there extreme prejudice here for the reasons I indicated at first, but they were going to try to capitalize on it. And you just look at the opening statement and you can see what they were doing. Uh, and again, I kicked myself because uh, over the weekend it became glaringly apparent what happened here. Uh, you know, they talked about the EU testing that they didn't produce. That proves the product's safe. 
They talk about Brian Moore testing it. Mr. Savaggio talks about it. That proves the product's safe. And then at the last minute, they're going to bring in Laura Brown with the secret testing, okay, that they have never produced, the proof the product's safe. So that's what was going on here, Your Honor. So they were trying to take advantage of their deliberate concealment. And for that reason, I think the, the uh, uh, remedy we propose is pretty moderate. You know, and, and like I've already said, if this wasn't a one-off case, I would agree with Mr. Parker, wholeheartedly agree with Mr. Odu that let's go have the evidence you're hearing, let's do what we should do, um, you know, let's thank somebody, but but I gotta look at the big picture, Ron, and that's what I'm doing, and that's why we're making the proposal we're making. You know, Ron, I just want to briefly address the, the, the last two comments by Mr. Rasmussen and Mr. Ron. Mr. Rasmussen made a mention of perhaps putting this in front of the special master. These things have occurred in front of your arm. And in the CCSD. Well, well, this is important too. When it comes to sanctionable issues like this, the special master doesn't get the determination that always come to me. That's right, John. At the end of the day, the special master could do a recommendation, but that would still come before your arm. And so, Your Honor, under that CCSD case, the, uh, the report, the Supreme Court indicated that the infraction and the revelation regarding the infraction happened in front of the court, it was in front of Judge Lett. In the uh, Young Rivero case, in this progeny, it says an evidentiary hearing is not required if you're seeking less than full striking of the hand. So it's not necessary. And then finally, Mr. Uh, Rasmussen said that this is being considered because of statements made by Mr. Savaggio. Or it's not just the statements made by Mr. Savaggio. It's the conduct of uh, the statements made by Mr. Rasmussen regarding what has been done. And it's the violations of the rules that occurred with the uh, during the process. So the court is not looking at one item. We're not asking the court to look at one infraction. It's a multitude of mistakes and misconduct committed and orchestrated by the uh, meter defendants. But our motion only goes to him. So I think that's our position. Mr. Your Honor, uh, we're not the rich counsel. We're a French Code counsel, but that, that's an issue for other, other folks. Um, the prejudice to real water continues to be a problem. Certainly the, the striking of these next two witnesses so we can conclude this case uh, today would be one possible remedy. And uh, Your Honor, as we argued previously, the problem is, you know, picking out the old spaghetti from the new spaghetti. They have created a situation where damages are going to go to the jury for compensatory damages, and the jury is going to make an award. And we are not going to know if that award was influenced by Mr. Savage and Wine, or by this testing which was never produced. We just don't know what effect that is going to have. And to have them go directly to compensatory damages, that I guess deters or punishes their behavior, but it doesn't cure the prejudice to real water. And we, we've got a curative instruction. We just don't think it's accurate. This is a this is a big problem, and it's not of our creating. And it's been a big problem since opening statement and all the way through this case. This was a decision that their strategy wasn't going to focus on the issues in this case, which is the failure to warn in the uh, uh, the negative or was it fit to, to take it? This is a complete attempt to bamboozle this jury as to other issues about real water's alleged negligence. And, and it's just their problem that they've created and there is no good fix. I am completely uh, on board. The plaintiffs don't want to do an evidentiary hearing. I don't want to do an evidentiary hearing. I want this case to go to the jury, hopefully today. Um, but this isn't a problem of our creation. All right. And, and I'll tell you what my thoughts are. And I thought about this case, and I do understand Johnny Rivero and Johnny Rivero factors. Uh, one of the factors um, um, I am to consider as a trial court is a lesser sanction under Johnny Rivero. Now, here's my question. And I, I don't know, this is a very unique issue. One thing we do know for sure is this. Uh, according to, uh, and I'm going to take his testimony at face value, 
according uh, to Mr. Silvagio, uh, there was testing done, right? We know that, first and foremost. Now, I don't mind sharing with you what my initial thoughts were as far as that's concerned, because that appears to be an uncontroverted fact, right? There was testing done, and it was never produced, right? And we'll never know what, what the results of the testing uh, would have been. Uh, just as important, too, and, I, and I, don't, I, I, I ask questions pertaining to the timeline, 2017, right? Same time the uh, conditioning kit was taken off the market um, in the EU, and it was no longer being sold in the United States. And so that kind of makes sense as far as a timing perspective. But um, um, I also thought about Bass Davis, and I don't mind saying that, because I was just kind of going through things. But an inference would be inadequate, right? We can agree with that. It would be. And he, I even thought about the presumption, but the presumption uh, would be rebuttable, but we have uncontroverted testimony regarding testing. So, and then I thought about, okay, we could go there as far as the ultimate determination as far as being damages only. But what, tell me this, and, this, and, and I understand evidentiary hearings and who knows what the court would want to do, uh, Supreme Court, and every case is different. Uh, why couldn't there be a factual determination by me that there was testing and it wasn't beneficial? You know, the problem that creates is everything that's been said and the testimony that's been received suggests that that testing led to their 48-hour tip card recommendation. And there's no way for us now to address it because we don't have the testing to actually compare to the 48-hour tip card recommendation. It leaves us and Real Water in a position that the jury is going to speculate that that testing, whatever testing it was, even if it's considered unfavorable, still led to the 48-hour tip card recommendation that uh, was used starting in 2018. That completely disadvantages the plaintiff and disadvantages, uh, I'm not a speaker of Mr. Purdue, but it certainly disadvantages his position. The, the, other, the other problem I see, Your Honor, and this is one of the, this is one of the benefits that Hannah and Milwaukee have, uh, have received, is that they've been able to put on every witness that they've wanted to put on, with the exception of Ms. Brown, who was on testified to testing, and these two other readings. And so they've been able to defend the case based upon an improper strategy the entire time. And there's no other way of us, there's no other way for us to clean this up. Otherwise, we probably have to re rethink our rebuttal case just to address what testing could or could not have been done and what those results could or could, have, could or may not have been. But there's no way for us to do that. We'd actually have to get our experts involved and then try to struggle through getting them prepared to deal with what potential testing could have been done, how it would have been done, and what the results could have been. And we don't have the benefit of that in discovery. We don't have it in the form of Mr. Babcock's job file. So there's no way for us to, to defend against that position, Your Honor. It's too late, the discovery is done, and we would have to bring our experts in to do it. And we don't have any of our experts lined up for rebuttal testimony because we didn't expect that what happened on Friday would have happened. No one could have expected that, Your Honor. The, story the, 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 the problem I see with these presumptions and inferences. Well, I kind of threw those aside. Yeah, that's why I said a factual determination. Even that, Your Honor, I mean, when we tried the Actos case, we had a situation where uh, Takeda, the pharmaceutical company, they destroyed 33 gigs worth of data on multiple hard drives. All their scientists who were the they just destroyed it. Uh, it was determined that there was enough material in there to fill up the library of Congress. They destroyed it. So the remedy that we had was a rebuttable presumption that that stuff would be helpful in the pointer's case. Well, you know, that sounds fine in theory, and maybe lawyers understand the significance of that, but the jury doesn't understand the significance of that because, you know, the, the inferences can go so many different ways, okay? Maybe some of the 10% of probes didn't work in this testing. That would prove that point. Maybe 20% didn't work. Maybe some of the probes took two days before they were measured negative or 
Maybe they took five days, maybe they took 10 days. That's another inference that would come out of that that they aren't able to re rebut, okay? Uh, another inference, maybe uh, it would only work up to 130 and it capped out, you know, like the example we gave earlier, the thermometer you stick your mouth and one goes to 98, it doesn't go above 130. So that means real water was adding concentrate every single time, okay? And so that would eliminate uh, any kind of argument whether there were enough inconsistent results. Maybe the inference is that it was inconsistent 50% of the time. There are just so many myriad of potential facts that arise out of an inference or a finding like that well, that, Mr. Kim, and I want to cut you off, sir. That's why I kind of took the inference and presumption, because I'll be candid with you. I don't think the juries understand the difference between the presumption and the Yeah, but they, they and that's why I kind of, you're on that way. I mean, i got to be honest with you, that's a meaningless remedy. Yes. That won't do us any good. Mr. Uh, 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 Rasmussen will stand up and make the same argument he would have made before. He'll probably even talk about testing. Uh, you know, to say that the testing would have been beneficial to plaintiffs, that's it. That's it. We don't know what kind of testing it was. That is really not a remedy, Your Honor. Not a remedy at all. All right, thank you, sir. Mr. Odo, you want to jump in on that? No, I don't really have anything to add, Your Honor. I, I, I tend to agree with uh, you know, the middle position from Mr. Kennedy and uh, Mr. Parker. It's just, again, it's a problem not of our creating to try and come up with a, a remedy like a factual determination then you know we, the jury maybe wonders well did real water know about this testing and, and you have to be very very careful as to what fact would be determined that's not going to prejudice real water and again we already have an instruction that the jury can disregard mr Salajo's testimony if they believe he was lying and i think they will follow that our concern is is it going to prejudice our defense on the compensatory damages we think it is and uh, I'm not sure that, that any of these remedies really work for that. <coughs> Sir? Again, what Brian Moore did back in 2017-2018 is not something <coughs> that as counsel for Hannah, I can go in and find that out. I have never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jason Brown, the operation manager from there. I don't know about their files at Milwaukee. That's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm here to defend Hannah. And so to say what we want to do is take away and, and, and sanction me for something that Brian Moore did, who we all agree passed away, is pretty harsh for Hannah. Even if, even if he is the facility's vice president at Hannah, those documents if there are any documents, again, we don't know what Brian Moore did. I don't know. I certainly wasn't counsel for Anna when this testing was done, and I didn't ask him about that testing, Your Honor. He brought that up on cross-examination from the plaintiff's counsel. So now the assumption is I know about this. <coughs> I'm, I'm a part of this. Hannah was a part of this. I don't know these things. <coughs> And then to say, well, Scott Rasmussen did this as counsel for Hannah, I think is going way beyond the basis that, that therefore they're compensatory liable, because that's an easy remedy to hit my client, Hannah, for something done by the general manager of Milwaukee way back in 2017 or 2018. That, that just seems very harsh when they have their own attorney. I, I'm not going to go talk to Jason Brown directly. I, there are two different companies. They followed all the corporate formalities. I'm not going to do that. If that testing and those results and all that stuff was available, that would have been a request for production document that would have been sent to Milwaukee saying, tell us about this, if it exists at all. And as a part of 16.1, Milwaukee would have responded, since it's the general manager of Milwaukee that conducted the testing. Now, what we can say is that Mr. Moore is not available to be, and so it's, it's a pretty harsh argument that I'm, I'm to be compensated, be, I'm supposed to, commensurate damage should be given because of what this person who died did, and I'm supposed to find out what he did through people that are not, I don't represent. That doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't 
It doesn't work that way. I, I shouldn't be sanctioned that harshly. But I'm not, I'm not sanctioning you, sir. I'm, just, I'm not, I'm not having any determination right now as far as the request made. But here's my question as far as that is concerned. I do understand the uh, different uh, corporate entities. But uh, Mr. Savaggio worked for both Milwaukee and Hannah, right? I agree. And I talked to Mr. Mill when, when, when Mr. Savaggio uh, and I talked, it was always about Hannah. If he needed to talk about Milwaukee, that would have had to be done through Mr. Robbins. He is Milwaukee's counsel, not me. No, I understand that, but I'm not really focusing on you. I'm focusing on the testing issue. And I, I, I know nothing about this. Okay. This is this is not something that I'm putting Mr. Sovazio on the stand to talk about secret testing by Brian Moore back in 2017. Okay? Which is the inference that's being made here. I, I don't know these things. He says it on the stand under under cross-examination by Mr. Kevin and Mr. Parker. I don't know these, that's that's a Milwaukee situation. That's not a HANA situation, it's certainly not mine. And then to say, but what we want to do is take that, whatever was done back then, okay, and we want to use it against HANA. When it's clearly something that was done by Milwaukee, for Milwaukee's MW500 or meter. I think that's just a little bit too far when, when a, so presumptions and, and things like this are done. If that's where the court is inclined to go, that's what we would suggest that that, that is what happens. And that's what I'm suggesting. Rather than say the harsh thing is what we want to do is just bind you to damages immediately as a hand for something that was done by a Milwaukee employee five years ago. And somehow I was supposed to find that out when I don't talk to people from Hannah, from Milwaukee, excuse me. And, and, here and I understand that he works for two different companies, but I don't talk to Mr. Silvaggio about Milwaukee. I understand, but, but my question is this because he's wearing two hats. He is, right. but I'm not. Yeah, but, but well, I'm not even understanding, I'm not focusing on you. I don't understand. I want, I'm, I'm focusing on Mr. Silvaggio. And uh, one thing for sure, he knew Mr. Moore did some testing, and the testing was, would have would have to have been at around the time that the conditioning kit was discontinued by the EU. And, uh, and it's Milwaukee conditioning kit. Yeah, no, no, but 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 my, I'm not focusing on who was the whether it was Milwaukee or Hannah, but he wore two hats, and so he had actual knowledge, obviously, that there was testing done by Mr. Moore because he testified. Right. And, and so, uh, and, and the That's testing was never produced. It was actually never identified during the course of discovery. Because it might be one thing that he knew it was. He said, and, and say hypothetically, six, seven months ago, he said, I know Mr. Moore was going to do some, did some testing, but I don't know what the results are. And then that would prompt a whole inquiry. But the testing that was done by Mr. Moore wasn't disclosed until September 26, 2023. Uh, when there was cross-examination then by uh, Mr. Park. And, and here's the problem. We don't know what the testing results would be. We have no clue. We do know that Mr. Moore is dead. We don't know what he did. I don't know what he did. I'm not asking those questions. It's not in my area. It's, it's, I, I'm here with Hannah, for sure. We understand that. I don't think anyone's disputing that I represent Hannah Instruments. I know that I would be talk about some more, but that's what I do. That's, that's what my representation is. Then on cross-examination, something comes up and all of a sudden, Hannah should be responsible for that, and Hannah should have been asking things about what Milwaukee did five years ago. I, I just don't think that is fair to Hannah to do what they want to do because it's easy, and this is how we can get things done, and it's, we, 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 we've, we've told the court, this is what the plaintiff's saying, this is exactly what we want you to do. Please follow what we want you to do as far as saying that, that we're compensatorily liable for work that was done by a Milwaukee employee. We should be compensatorily liable because Carl Savaggio wears two hats. And I, I get that, but now you're asking me to go and find out everything about Milwaukee. 
I, I don't talk to Milwaukee. If, if those things were available, I, I'm not the primary person. The control of that stuff would have been with Milwaukee. Thank you. Mr. Robbins. Thank you, Honor. Um, so I get where, you're, where your honor is going with the timing of it. Because I, you know, if the, if the MA9025 was discontinued in 2017. And for the record, that's conditioning yet. That is, your honor. Okay. And, um, and the tip card was introduced sometime shortly thereafter. I don't know the exact date. But, um, you know, I could see where your honor could jump to the conclusion and say, hey, that lines up, there's testing. But I also think you might be giving them a little too much credit um, about this testing. And again, I'm going to refer the court to the trial transcript where he goes back and forth. And in some instances, he says there's, he believes there's testing and uh, or there is testing. And then I will point you to uh, 926 at lines 4 through 6 where he says it could have been. I don't think he knows. So that, that's my first, I guess, caution I would throw to everybody saying that there's definitely testing. I, I don't think we have that. I don't think we're there, uh, number one. So I think you would need an evidentiary hearing. Uh, secondly, if the court were to entertain the liability determination that's been uh, thrown out there, the only cause of action, um, well, I mean, the cause of action that gets handed is for inadequate warning. And so the suggestion that 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 there be a liability determination against Hannah, that obviously affects, affects Milwaukee. And there's jury instructions to that effect that say the manufacturer, the distributor, the retailer are all the same. And that's it. That's it. Uh, on my set, page thirty. Um, that instruction. So that's even though you're saying it's only against uh, Hannah. It's strict product liability, so you're basically giving summary judgment against me as well, at least on the liability. So, for all those reasons, if we're going down this path, there needs to be an evidentiary hearing. Um, I am uncertain if there's any testing. I, I do understand where your honor's going with it. It kind of makes sense, but I also think you may be giving them too much credit uh, to, to make that leap without making that finding on that is, I think, problematic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Peppermint. Your Honor, that, what Mr. Robbins just said it ignores the problem and what the acute prejudice is from this. They, and Hannah specifically, <clears throat> introduced this idea that there had been testing. They introduced that, oh, the product was tested. It was submitted to European regulators. European uh, gave us the CE stamp of approval. That's what Mr. Rasmussen said in the opening. This was an orchestrated strategy from the beginning to introduce this idea, oh, our warnings are fine, it's been tested. Our, our product is safe, it's been tested. 48 hours the minimum, that's been tested without ever actually producing the testing. So even if the testing was never done, and Mr. Rasmussen was wrong when he stood up in front of this court and said, Laura Brown has done testing, my client has done testing or that uh, when Mr. Salvaggio testified that, oh yes, there had been testing, there, Mr. Moore had done testing on the tip card, and raised those specters in front of the jury, then if they're, that testing, if that was all a lie, then there's, they're telling the jury that it's something that exists doesn't exist. It's the same prejudice either way. They brought this argument up, which, by the way, violates plaintiff's motion to eliminate 26, which says you can't argue compliance with these other uh, manufacturing standards as a defense, which was granted, but it put into the jury's mind that there, all this testing had been done when they never produced it, never gave us the opportunity to look at it, never gave us the opportunity to use it to cross-examine. So it's like this testing can only support their position. And that is the bell that you can't unring. We can't go back in time. There's no instruction to the jury that we could get. And this was all done at, at Hannah's insistence. So this, this truck attempt to divert and um, push the responsibility aside is wrong because it was Hannah in the opening who said, point blank, uh, see that European CE standard? It can, our Milwaukee instrument conforms to CE European directives. Then you get that stamp to say that. 
which means it was tested. Does, did real water test? We don't know. We just know our product was, referring to it being tested. That's an opening statement. That's Hannah saying, making those statements to the jury. They're introducing that to the jury. Then we get to Mr. Salvaggio's uh, testimony, and this is direct on uh, page 110 of the transcript. He's asking them about approving the instructions and he said, and revising the instructions. And, he, and he, Mr. Salvaggio says, oh, the research team in Romania would do the revisions. Introducing this idea that there's some research team doing revisions based on testing in Romania that, again, has never been produced. Uh, I haven't need to make any revisions because the research team does all that. Uh, then he tries to ask him about the CE, the, the certification. What does that mean? Then forces us to object. Then there's a lengthy uh, discussion at the, the bench on this, all in front of the jury, during Mr. Uh, Salvaggio's direct examination that the jury sees after being told the CE means the product was tested, and then our objection is sustained. What, what is the jury to interpret from that? that, oh, Mr. Rasmussen's telling them, Anna's telling them that our product's been tested, it's approved in Europe, and then when he tries to bring that out in front of them, we have to object, and then it's not in. That looks like we're keeping something from the jury, at, in the, even in the best case interpretation. So the prejudice from all this, from Hannah repeatedly raising the specter of this testing that has never been produced, is, is the prejudice in all this. And that's Hannah's responsibility, on that. And, and Laura Brown, that they tried to do it again with Laura Brown. That's why, and again, I'll direct you to that transcript where you asked, we're not talking about the bad cop testing. We're talking about Hannah. Has Hannah done any testing? And Mr. Rasmussen responds, Laura Brown did that testing, but you wouldn't let her testify. Now we're saying, oh, well, we don't know what Laura Brown did. It, who knows what she tested? If she tested the probe and the testing's not done. The, the conflicting statements on this are, should be dispositive in its own right. Uh, there's clear violations, clear concealment, and clear prejudice in front of the jury, Your Honor. I mean, I think what we're asking for is a very mild sanction compared to the conduct of the issue here. Your Honor, I'm sorry. Your Honor, no, go ahead. Okay. Your Honor, one thing that I want to point out, and this is something that no one has mentioned thus far, but we've received jury questions that go to the heart of what Hannah has been trying to take advantage of in terms of this unknown testing. The testing that was done that we've not been provided with it suggests that their product has been proven through some form of testing. So we've had a jury question on that point. The other thing I want to point out, Garner, is that when you answer interrogatories, when you answer requests for production of documents, that is an affirmation by the attorney signing those documents that he's complied with the rule or he or she has complied with the rule. So when Mr. Rasmussen says that this is something Mr. Savaggio said or may know or not know, when he signed those interrogatories, when he verified the interrogatories that there was no testing that should have been produced or identified, and the lawyer does so, that also means the lawyer did the due diligence to make sure that information is correct. So this cannot be put only at the doorstep of Mr. Savaggio or his testimony. It, all, it goes back to the answers to interrogatories and the uh, due diligence that's required under the rule. Same with uh, Rule 34 and under Rule 16.1. You know. Sir, Your Honor, I have a slightly uh, different view than Mr. Parker. Um, the lawyers, um, let me say it this way the client's problems are not the lawyer's problems. These are client uh, problems. I agree with you on that. I mean, I don't mind saying it because uh, at the end of the day, uh, I don't think it's the actions of any counsel in here. I think it goes back to the fact that there was testing and we have direct testimony or admissions on the stand by Mr. Savaggio. And we know there was, there was testing at two, at two different time periods. We know by Mr. Moore, who's unfortunately passed away, and we have Ms. Brown. I, I, I get that. And the, uh, apparently the testing was never produced or never discovered. Uh, and, but I don't want to cut you off, and I'll share, share with you what my thoughts are as I go through this analysis. No, I appreciate mind. that, Yarn, because I think it's a very important point to make that you know the lawyers do the best they can, the clients tell them 
what they think they're going to testify to, and if the client gets up on cross and says something unexpected, that's not the lawyer's fault. And so I want to be very clear that the, uh, at least as far as the lawyer's position goes, and our concern is the parties, not the lawyers. Um, and as to the parties, we would point out that Milwaukee argued in opening, uh, and it was, a, it was a point Mr. Pepperman started to make, he hit it a little bit, but he didn't hit it hard enough in my view, which is not only did they do the testing and say, you know, what wonderful company they are, basically, but they then said, and look at how bad real water is. And in opening, uh, Milwaukee argued, there is no safety testing. So this is food. Actually, water, I think, falls under a food product. It's bottled water. And you have to do some type of testing to make sure everything that touches your product is safe. So right there, they're signaling to the jury that their testing showed their product was safe, and real water's product wasn't tested, which we've argued is not true, but they weren't testing for everything. And then it continues, and the formula is safe, and if whatever ingredients you're putting into it is safe, your bottling procedure is safe. Everything should be tested before it goes out. That's, that's Milwaukee's argument in open, and that's why this is, this is a problem. Again, it's not the lawyers, it's, it's the company. The company set up this, what the plaintiffs call the Hydra, with these different corporations having a few handful of employees and try to compartmentalize all this knowledge. And the problem that the company has is the guy who worked for both let slip that this testing was done. And that's why it should go to both. Well, hold on one second. I want to address something that you say. You know, this is not an indictment of Mr. Uh, Rasmussen. This is in terms of Rule 33 and 34 and 16.1. If his attorney, if his clients are leading him in a certain direction and he believes he's done a due diligence that supports their uh, testimony at the time or their discussions, whatever those discussions were, that's one thing. And that's something we can accept. But when Mr. Rasmussen said that Laura Browning or Laura Brown did testing, and Mr. Savaggio said testing had been done. And he and Savaggio is the president, not just an employee, but the president of Milwaukee. Certainly, when the interrogatory came across the desk and they were presented to Mr. Savaggio, which he signed, that information should have been disclosed. And so this is not, again, Mr. Rasmussen, if it was taken that way, obviously, Mr. Dew thought it was pointed in that direction. It's not an indictment of Mr. Rasmussen, but it's an obligation under rule that this information should have been produced. First in the interrogatories, and then subsequently in the request for production of that. Right, and he, and I just wanted to expand upon the point that I don't think generic inferences or, for, uh, or presumptions are an adequate possible remedy. I just want to give you three examples. If you determine these three things as facts, which all could have been shown by the testing that was used. One, the testing proved that the MW500 takes inconsistent orc readings if the probe is not conditioned. That would be an uncontested, that would be a fact that could have been produced, uh, proven by the testing. Two, the testing proved the MW500 probe must be conditioned for 10 days to take negative orc readings. That could have been proven by the testing, Your Honor. They could have been probes that were uh, needed to be conditioned for 10 days. Three, testing proved the MW500 probe could not measure negative 225 if not conditioned for 10 days. That is a fact that could have been proved by this testing, Your Honor. And that's why, unless you're gonna tell the jury something specific like these three facts, you just can't have some generic, oh, any possible thing ever that the testing would No, I took, I took the inferences and presumptions off the table. I'll take it another step, Mr. Yeah. Kip. And you can tell me, because I don't mind sharing with everyone my analysis. I don't know my thoughts. I, I really don't. Because it's really important from a record perspective. And because uh, as I as we start the discussion, I mean, I, I think it was factored in regarding John Rivero. Uh, but I have to consider lesser sanctions, right? And that's what I, I talked about. But in working through it, I, I actually had a, a slightly different uh, consideration, but the ones you brought up are very important. Uh, for example, if the testing reflected that it took 10 days, I'm just hypothetic, it took 10 days to condition, uh, under those circumstances, potentially uh, having a factual determination in that regard 
could be inadequate, and I'll, I'll tell you why. <coughs> because hypothetically, if that was the test, then you'd probably move for a 50A motion on the inadequacy of warning at the close of the testimony. In fact, I could have moved for that already because the expert admitted that none of this was in the user manual. Okay, I mean, I'm taking a big picture approach here, okay? I know this, this is why these, and so if you propose doing the inference we're entitled to as an absolute finding, they would stand up and say, oh, judge, you're determining liability. You can't do that. That's why they want an inference or presumption because they know it's not an adequate remedy. They know they'll be able to weasel around, okay? That's why the, the proposal we made, which is a compensatory determination as to hand only, and again, Laura Brown was a HANA employee. Every time we talk about it, Mr. Rasmussen runs to Mr. Uh, Ryan Moore and says, oh, dead man, dead man, dead man. Laura Brown is a living employee. She was here in Las Vegas all week last week getting ready to testify. She had these secret tests with her, okay? Maybe they weren't finished, but she did them. She had them. So to suggest that there's some basis to allow them to conceal all that information in a false interrogatory request for production response that, oh, there is no secret testing, anything's in Romania, when the witness they had here sitting in the hallway had the secret testing, did the secret testing, that's what, uh, that's the misconduct, Your Honor. That is why the only thing to do is to make a liability determination as to Hannah. And, and I've already said too much, Your Honor. I, I, I don't want to spend this much time on it, uh, but, but I think the remedy we propose is the only thing to do. Is, I think it's well thought out before things about it. So. Let's take a quick recess. I'll come back with my message. All right. Take it. Uh, we'll be able to talk to the jury. We'll have to back for Manual has actually been put into evidence in this case. 
There's a line in there that talks about certification and the director said it conforms to. It's right there. I, I don't know how else to get to say that it isn't in our operator's manual, which is in evidence. And that was all that needed to be brought up on that is whether or not it was there. But the reality is, let me just say it again, Laura Brown was involved by providing to Dr. Babcock MW 500 meters that were then used by Dr. Babcock to test with. Now, with regard to, because I went back and looked at it, with regard to uh, uh, the testing by, that came up for the first time in this courtroom and is not part of any of the answers by Hannah with regard to Brian Moore, who was an employee of Milwaukee. You need to understand in this case, at the very beginning, Milwaukee sued Hannah. I can't go talk to those people. <clears throat> Eventually, that particular cross claim was, by stipulation, dismissed. But I can't talk to Milwaukee employees. Obviously, I can't talk to Mr. Moore, but I don't have any way of getting to the records. So the remedy that the plaintiffs want, because of Mr. Moore's testing, is to hit Hannah with uh, um, compensatory liability is now off the table. I am compensatory liable for something that Milwaukee performed five years ago when it was Milwaukee that sued Hannah. And then I'm supposed to figure out about that later on in this case and produce that because Carol Salvaggio is the vice president of facilities at Hannah and would have custody control over stuff that was done at Milwaukee. And we actually went back and looked, I looked at all the answers that were given by Milwaukee. And there, and I couldn't find anything where the plaintiffs asked for testing directly to Milwaukee, nor did I find any interrogatories, requests for production of documents, or anything to Hannah saying, please produce all testing the only thing I can tell you is that what we did do is we did provide as a part of our, in March of 2023, all the testing that was done by Dr. Babcock. Um, so we'll see what happens, but, but I think the courts already made the remedies with regard to this. Laura Brown was not allowed to testify. The testing of Dr. Babcock was not allowed. And now let's just go a step further for things that have not been allowed in the evidence and now just admit liability to the jury with regard to this. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to make sure that my record was clear on these things because it was not clear to everyone. I'm trying to make it clear to this court. Laura Brown was involved by providing MW 500 meters to Dr. Babcock so that he could do his testing on this. So that's what I know, okay? Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Any response to that before? I, I, want to. I want to so much, Your Honor. The only thing I would point out is maybe Mr. Rasmussen didn't read the uh, motion because it actually addresses the interrogatories to Hannah and the question question documents to Hannah, which were signed by Mr. Savaggio for the interrogatories. Your Honor, the transcript is clear. There were, there was a different testing he was referring to. You couldn't have been clearer about asking that. He said, uh, Dr. Babcock did that testing and you said that can't be allowed. You're, you're the court. I wasn't talking about Bab Babcock. I was talking about your client, Mr. Rasmussen. We did that testing. And you said, wait, wait, am I missing something? Mr. Rasmussen, no, my client did it. You were not allowing Laura Brown to testify and that's okay, we got it. And then he goes on later and tries to backtrack. And then he says, uh, when Mr. Parker asked him, but you said she, referring to Laura Brown, did the testing. Mr. Rasmussen, she did. And you haven't produced that test, those test results, have you? Because it's a warning case. So he admits he hasn't produced Laura Brown's test results. At another point, he said that she, that Laura Brown's testing wasn't completed yet. Dr. Babcock's testing was completed. It just wasn't substantially similar. Finally, on page 75 of the transcript, Mr. Rasmussen, okay, real simple. Laura Brown has done testing. That's, mm -hmm. that's Mr. Rasmussen's representations to the court. 
Okay, real simple. Laura Brown has done testing. So this is just another conflicting statement to suggest that it's all the Babcock testing and there's no other testing. All right. Anyway, uh, and I really think it's important to take a look at the record. And in, in its very essence, as far as the products case is concerned, specifically regarding the warning issue, uh, the required oxidation time of the platinum probes is a key issue. That's what the, that's what the whole, uh, that's the essence of the product defect case uh, allegations are pertaining to the manufacturer and distributor as far as the probe is concerned. And it's, uh, I guess, the meter and the probe. And, and you, you just can't overlook that. And, that. and that's a real key issue because it really ties in uh, directly to the tip card and also the manual. Um, and for example, if testing uh, determined that it took a much longer time period to condition the platinum probes at issue, and that wasn't supported by or the same time period um, as set forth in the tip card, uh, the tip card and the manual would be defective. That's, that's really and truly what the case is about. Um, just as important too, and I had to go back and I, I, my, my instincts were correct in this regard, because uh, I went back, and the only reason I went back, I wanted to take a quick look at uh, Young versus Johnny Rivero, because it was my recollection, and, and I don't have the opportunity to, to do this because the written order has not been prepared or anything like that, but uh, based upon the language of the um, decision, I knew I had to, whatever decision I make, as far as the request and sanctions, I have to discuss some of the factors set forth in Johnny Rivero. And this is what our Supreme Court says on page 93 of the decision. They say, quote, we will requ further require that every order of dismissal with prejudice as to discovery sanctions be supported by express, careful, and preferably written explanation of the court's analysis of the pertinent factors. And so I just wanted to make sure that was clear and I addressed some of the factors here as far as uh, the requirement by our Supreme Court. And the first factor, and they say, you know, and they say these aren't all encompassing. They say uh, uh, they give factors the court may properly consider to include, but not limited to, I guess, the following. Uh, the first would be the degree of willingness of the offending party. And um, all I can say is this in that regard um, Rule 16 or 16.1 is very clear that if you have. Um, facts, evidence, um, say results of tests and studies in your possession, you got to produce them, right, voluntarily. But what's important too is essentially this. Um, there was a request for production of documents and it would be request number 13. That's specifically focused on testing. And it provides its following, quote, Please produce true, accurate, and complete copies of any and all documents related to safety tests, including but not limited to calibration tests for your M and W series meters between the years of 2011 to the present day, period. It goes further, it says this request includes but is not limited to any testing results, data, notes, correspondence regarding the test, and meeting minutes regarding the test. And uh, this was submitted with plaintiff's first set of requests for production of documents to hand instruments back on uh, July 12th of uh, 2022. And, and that's important to, from, from this perspective. Uh, ideally, some sort of response like, I mean, a response to a request for production of documents would have been, say, August or September of last year, so <coughs> over a year ago. And so uh, this case, and, and I think it's important to point this out, too, and I think this could be overlooked potentially by a reviewing court. Um, uh, we've had a lot of 
written discovery, and uh, hearings were held on every issue. And it's my recollection, there were how many motions, pre-trial motions? 116, Your Honor, I think. What's, what's the number? I think 116, Your Honor. 116 pre-trial motions. <coughs> a lot of time, we spent, what, six weeks? Started July 24th and finished September 5th, Your Honor. And I think that gets overlooked. But just as important, too, and I, I think this is really important because uh, in a general sense, as, as a trial judge, we had a vigorous discussion regarding a um, jury questionnaire in this case, right? We did. And uh, it can't be overlooked that once we um, came to some an agreement, uh, as, as probably 98% of whatever was contained in the questionnaire, and I wrote on everything, um, uh, that's important because as a trial judge, I think, I, uh, Mr. Marshall, how many times did you go down to the third floor and as far as this case is concerned? I want to say it's eight to nine times, Your Honor. Right. For, for and we start off with Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays, Your Honor. Right. And, and here's my point. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's effort overlooked, right? Because that's all part of preparing this case for trial. And uh, each time I would go down and introduce myself to the jury, I would square them in and explain to them why they are there, why they received a summons in the mail, and uh, why it was important for them to participate. And I think we have a pretty good jury. Uh, so so that, can't over, that can't be overlooked, uh, along with all the uh, efforts that have gone through preparing this case for trial and also trying it. So when I, come, when I, when I get back to uh, the willfulness of the offending party, and I want to make sure the record's clear, we're talking about the offending party. I'm not talking about counsel here at all, right? Because that's the first thing <coughs> I have to consider. And it appears to me that potentially, if you look at the, the call of the question, uh, Mr. Moore's testing should have been produced, right? Ms. Brown's testing should have been produced. But also, potentially, results of the EU testing should have been produced, too. Because this was from 2011 to the present. It's number one. And so it wasn't. I don't know of any other way I could look at it other than, than uh, uh, willful. Then here's the next question that comes up. And this is something I was really focusing on. Um, the extent to which the non-offending party would be prejudiced by a lesser sanction. Um, and I think two of these kind of go hand in hand. As far as uh, one, I don't really have to address because I'm not, let me make sure I'm here, clear. Um, I'm not sure And they talk about the dismissal. I'm not going to dismiss. It's not going to be a dismissal of the answer in this case. I don't really have to address that. But um, here's the issue. And it's, and it's really a fundamental issue uh, as it pertains to the, the uh, product defect complaint. Um, potentially, and we'll never know this, the testing could support the plaintiff's position in this case that the tip card and slash or the uh, instruction manual and anything contained on the uh, box were inadequate, right? And we'll never know that. Here's the next one, whether any evidence has been irreparably lost. Well, for, for the purposes of this, of this trial, it has, because it hadn't been produced. We're, we're, we're like moments away from um, instructing the jury. Now, the next factor, the feasibility and fairness of alternative, less severe sanctions, such as an order deeming facts relating to the improperly withheld or destroyed evidence to be admitted by the offending party. Now, I really, that's the one I was really kind of focusing on when I was asking questions as to, because I looked at the case from this perspective, I don't think Bass Davis really has an application as it pertains to uh, the inference and or uh, presumption. Uh, this is a slightly different case. Uh, but, but here's the point, and I, and, and I think this is an important point as it pertains to uh, this factor and deeming facts 
admitted, well, when you look at it through this perspective, if hypothetically uh, I deemed the instruction card, tip card, I should say, and operator's manual and the box inadequate based upon the testing results, and if I made that finding, then the next step would be a 50A motion. Right? I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'm, I'm going there. Because, um, and understand this, this case is in a different procedural posture than Young versus Johnny Rivera. Um, <clears throat> next, the policy favoring adjudication on the merits. And I do believe that. I believe that. And uh, ultimately, we will have an adjudication on the merits of this case after I make a decision. Uh, next factor, whether the sanction unfairly operates to penalize a party for the misconduct of his or her attorney. Well, there's been no attorney misconduct here. I'll say that for the record. And then that last but not least is the need to deter both the parties and future litigants from <coughs> similar abuses. Uh, that's a very important factor to consider also. And of course, that's why we have sanctions pursuant to Rule 37. Uh, it's not only to potentially penalize an offending party in the case in chief, but also future litigants from taking up the, the, the same or similar course of conduct. Uh, here's my point, and this is the bottom line as far as the way I see it. Um, we have two levels of testing that should have been been produced uh, and and here's why um, it would be to me it'd be a complete waste of time to even attempt to have an evidentiary hearing is because Carl Savaggio on the stand admitted there was testing on the probes right and and that and I want to say it again on the probes and this comes straight from his deposition this is page four of the uh, plaintiff's position paper. Uh, and just as important too, he admits that Mr. Mr. Moore did some testing. And, I, and what's really key about Mr. Moore's testing, and I think this is supported by the prior timeline, because I asked questions specifically regarding uh, the tip sheet, questions regarding <coughs> the uh, conditioning kit, and the fact that the conditioning kit was recalled, it's my understanding, it was around 19, 2017. Uh, the tip sheet came sometime thereafter, and we know Mr. Morris, been, he's passed away quite some time ago, right? And we'll never have his testing, and I think that's really key. We don't even know if Mr. Morris' testing was a basis for the tip sheet or not. We know nothing. We just don't. I think Ms. Brown's testing is important too, but. At the end of the day, uh, uh, and considering uh, Young versus Johnny Rivero, uh, the fact that we're preparing for closing argument right now, we finalize the jury instructions. Uh, I don't see a need for a evidentiary hearing. Uh, there's been a, uh, an admission on the record by uh, a party who was both a president, I think he was vice president for uh, the other company, right? He had dual roles. Uh, he's a managing speaking agent, and he admitted there was testing that should have been produced in this case. Uh, consequently, I'm going to grant the request of the relief. Prepare an order, Mr. Your Honor. Your Honor. Sir. Um, and I'm not certain what, what the relief is, so. Um, no, I think we're going to. And I'm not asking the court to explain it right now. Um, I just want to, as a matter of procedure, because it could affect one or both causes of action against me. Um, I was going to wait till the close of evidence uh, to file my uh, Rule 50A2 motion, but we have a, a motion that we'd like to file with the court, and we can consider whatever time is appropriate for your honor, but I'd like to make sure that that's on the record uh, before any order is entered or ruling. Uh, striking or uh, finding a liability on any of the causes of action against the party. I understand. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. So where do we go from here? 
I don't know if they want to play the deposition excerpts or not. I think they resolved part of it. Uh, maybe not all of it, but part of it. And Your Honor, before we get there, there was a curative instruction uh, that the Red Water proposed, <coughs> and in light of the court's ruling, I think that this curative instruction is important. You think it's important to me? I do, Your Honor. Um, I think the relief granted uh, by the court certainly resolves the issue at the hand, but it doesn't uh, resolve the prejudice to real water from the conduct of Hannah during the course of the trial. And that continues to be something that um, there's not an adequate remedy for. I'm sorry, there's not um, comparative strict liability. We have there's no such animal. Right? Exactly, Your Honor. There's no such animal, and, and we have some things that have happened by a, a party that, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, would have been in a separate case, and those are going to contaminate in real water as you get a jury verdict as to real water. And I just wanted to reiterate that record. We think our curative instruction helps somewhat. I understand. And I don't say anything I said I wouldn't get it. I don't know that we discussed it. I, I want to okay. Know. And this is the one with the Gunderson reference at the bottom? Yes, Your Honor. And Hannah, I think Milwaukee proposed an alternative to this one. We did, Your Honor. That's in the proposed set, second amended set of proposed jury instructions, which we've also pursued to Rule 51. Either it's in, it has been served or it's in the process of being served on it. Uh, do I have that real quick? Because I'd like to look at it. Did you give me a copy? I did, Your Honor. I have so much on my desk now. Sir. Yeah, it's on page four there. I can give you another copy if you'd like to. Before you make that effort. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, this is a response to Bill Waters' proposed curative instruction. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, I give you the paper. We you know that you just now checked. Yeah, they got paper copies of it. That's from uh, as far as um, <coughs> real waters proposed curative instruction. <coughs> what's the problem? Is it the, I believe um, Hannah has some grammatical concerns, but um, we believe it's appropriate considering. Uh, the uh, purported attempt to establish comparative strict liability. That's been an argument throughout this case, and that's why we think the curative instruction is necessary because the totality of the arguments have been made by the meter defendants. Um, as we noted, and I'm not going to repeat the records, uh, there are numerous arguments about you know, real water being more liable than they are, more negligent than they are. Well, negligence should even be discussed. It shouldn't. And yet, we have these arguments, and now they want to play clips from Blaine Jones's deposition that have absolutely no relevance to any uh, defense that the media defendants are putting on. So at a minimum, we hope that the Blaine Jones uh, testimony is not going to be played for the jury because we object to that, and we also object to the Anthony Brown testimony because, again, um, it goes allegedly to the conditioning, and the court's already found there's a problem with the the evidence in the state of conditioning. So we object to both, but the instruction, I think, is relatively straightforward. Their, their big argument with the instruction side of the grammar is they don't like the statement that their argument was improper under Nevada law, and it clearly is under Young <coughs> Machine Company versus Long 100 Nevada 692 1984. Yeah, I know. Yes, ma'am. Um, our, our comments on Young is that Young was, um, came out in 1984. The statute at that time made uh, defendants jointly liable. Um, there was no comparative liability at all. Since then, it has been amended twice in 1987, I believe, in 1989. Um, the Cafe Moda case kind of discusses the uh, court's 
attempt to balance the different things the legislature have, has done in order to balance the uh, plaintiff's interest in being uh, comp fully compensated for their injuries and the interests of defendants in not being unjustly forced to pay for the acts of other unrelated defendants. Um, I certainly can understand if you look at the present state of the statute and say, well, it just makes an exception for strict liability. I'm going to go with that. I don't think that exception <coughs> would apply to uh, two different products. Um, I'll give you a site from a case in California, which I understand. It, it just it has the same um, discussion of the issues that are raised by this. The site is Arena versus Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation. 63 Cal Appellate, 4th, 1178, um, from 1998. I would also refer to the Cafe Moda case. And if you'll give me a minute, I'll find it. I have a copy here. But in the Cafe Moda case, our Supreme Court discussed um, whether or not two different defendants would be jointly liable for plaintiff's damage. One person, one of the defendants was an intentional um, tort feeser and the other person, the other person was a casino. So I, I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but there are principles here that are being lost or not. And, the, and we believe that young, young statement has been, um, should, have, should be changed by the fact that the, the statute has been revised twice since it came out. The site for the Cafe Moda case is 128 Nevada 78, and it's 2012. Right, and here's my question on that because understand there's a distinction between um, intentional, intentional towards assault and battery as, as, as in contrast to uh, what we have here. Uh, all defendants are being sued, although uh, <coughs> different theories under strict products liability. I do understand we have the uh, implied warranty fitness for a particular purpose issue. But, but in looking at it through that perspective, uh, we're not talking about uh, comparing intentional torts to a, say, negligence claim, for example, or intentional torts with strict products liability claim. And so under those circumstances, ma'am, what do I do? Because the law is slightly different in that regard. And the reason why I bring that up is this. I think I gave an example last week, and unfortunately, you weren't here. And I used a, a motor vehicle example and said you were suing a major, major automotive manufacturer. And... Uh, the allegations are uh, defects in the brake assembly, right? And under those circumstances, uh, you sue the component part manufacturer for straight products liability, and you also sue the manufacturer, right? And so that's kind of what's going on here in a way, I guess, but slightly different. Here we're suing the manufacturer and also a, uh, a manufacturer of a component part that was utilized by the product manufacturer. That's a slightly different animal. That's what we have. And we would disagree that it's a component part. Um, the case in California, there were two different products that caused uh, asbestos exposure. In that <coughs> case, they said, you know, generally, yeah, it would be unfair to, if there were two separate products, then we're not going to apply joint liability to them. I know that's California. And I understand, I'm not, um, intentional courts, they are the same under NRS 41-141 because they are, they're included in the same list. Well, intentional um, courts, for, what are you talking about? For purposes well, of punitive in, damages? In 41.141, okay. they include intentional courts as one of the exceptions to the um, principle that you do not kind of tag one defendant with the percentage of responsibility that is um, allocated to the other person, to the other defendant. Um, and I just think the Cafe Moda case, I'm not telling you what to do, I'm just saying. I I'm, I'm it. listening, you can tell me what to do. I'm just saying they have a really good explanation of their competing interests here, and we're trying to balance the interests, you know, to be fair to the defendants and be fair to the plaintiffs. It's, 
you know, and that's our argument to some extent is, you know, there should be a, a verdict form that asks what percentage do you allocate this to real water and what percentage do you allocate this to to the meter defendants. Um, and Cafe Moda is not directly on point. I just think the uh, thoughts in there on balancing the interests and how they apply in NRS 41.141 are interesting and they weigh in our favor. Well, Judge, uh, just real briefly, Cafe Moda interpreted 41.141 and it did it in a comparative negligence context. We had negligence and intentional tort. But what counsel misses when she runs to California is NRS 41.141 subpart 5 says, quote, this section does not affect the joint and several liability, if any, of the defendants in an action based upon a strict liability. Right in the statute. Right in the statute. No, I have it open right here. Okay. okay. Well, okay. Your Honor, that's why this cafe moda argument in the California authorities, it's, it's just not working. And I can specifically add that California is, doesn't have a similar statute. There's actually a, a portion of liability amongst joint tort feasors in actions based on uh, strict liability. So any reference that the California rule should be applied is contrary to that law. Sir. Well, they still most of my thunder. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Uh, NRS 41.141. Uh, and the reason is the applicable statute. The reason why we like the Young's Marsh case is because that case came out right when they were adopting NRS 41.141. Moreover, as counsel has indicated, uh, California law is not applicable here. There is no corresponding statute. California law follows Lee versus Yellow Cab. Um, I think it's American Motorcycle, something else about a uh, portion of fault in negligence cases. This is a strict products liability case. We have a Nevada statute directly on point, and a California case can't have a rule in Nevada statute. And for the record, I don't mind saying this, I'm going to follow uh, 41.1 to one uh, subsection 5A. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so where do we go from here? Juan? Well, is the court going to give the instruction? Oh, oh, I, I apologize. Yeah. I mean, it's not where we would go. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking here. I'm just, I'm going to take one last one. 